Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. My first guest heard an interview that I did with Eva Bartlett, the Canadian journalist who visited Syria over the winter, over the Christmas period. Uh, She was delighted to hear a Western journalist give what she feels is a balanced view of how Syrians feel about the five-year war or conflict. Uh, Whatever you want to call that, we have very strong opinions, of course, about it. Uh, that's been raging since 2011. She's going to talk to me about how Syrians are embracing citizen journalism to tell the truth about what has really happened to their country. She's a Damascus University graduate and is working in the Syrian capital right now as a translator. Let's welcome to the programme Jamila Assi. Jamila, welcome to the programme. How are you? Hi, hi, Alan. I'm fine. It's really, really lovely to have you on the show. Um, I know it's getting late there in Damascus. It's coming up for 10.30 uh, yeah. in, in the evening. So mm-hmm. um, uh, terrific that you've stuck around to, to chat with us. Jamila, I'm going to ask you straight up, um, if you could sum up or try to, to sum up what life has been like over the last five years for you and your family and your friends and colleagues in Damascus, how would you describe it to somebody like me who's never experienced it? Well, summing it up, summing all that pain in, in a few minutes or a few words is not really easy. But um, life for the last, past five years was a true hell on earth. And I wouldn't say to me as much as other people who saw hell more than anyone else. Uh, it was absolute torture for everybody to lose their beloveds, to lose their country, to lose that peaceful life we, ha- we used to have before war. And this drastic change of, in life, we never imagined that it would reach this level. Being the social change, the uh, security in the country, the financial and economical change, everything in a moment our entire life changed so describing it is nothing like living it actually what do you remember jamila of how things started what do you remember of the beginnings you know today i as i was getting ready to talking with you i was just going back five years ago when everything started i am originally from Dara. And this is where everything started five years ago. You know, things were not very clear. They said about people protesting and demanding freedom and democracy and liberty. And that sounded like something nice and cool. But then things didn't seem like that. We saw peoples with beards and with extremist views going to the streets, going out of mosques and going to... Um, to push people from power only for religious reasons or the like. So all the compassion we had for those slogans in the beginning started to fade down very short time after the event started. And then we felt foreign uh, intervention, whether by support, sending arms from many countries that is no secret to anybody now countries like Turkey like Saudi Arabia we started to see funding coming to those people and all those countries sending funding where extremist or um, countries that felt threatened by the secularism of Syria so little by little they started to talk media started to talk about a civil war but with around foreign fighters in Syria, I don't think you can say that this is a civil war. A civil war is when a brother slaughters his brother for some reason. But now we have people from all over the world, from France, from Germany, from Tunisia, slaughtering us, the Syrians. So the media played a very negative part in developing the, uh, in the, in worsening the events, actually, because they presented to the world an image that we are killing each other and that our army is killing us while in fact those same media stations 
supported by their own countries, were causing our death every minute when they fabricated news and ideas and fabricated the image instead of doing the right thing, which is reflecting reality and saying what is really happening. So you, you noticed, Jamila, very early on that these so-called democracy seekers were in fact not Syrian. They weren't anybody whom you know you knew or recognised. It was very obvious very early on that these were foreign agents or these were mercenaries whom were sent in to cause trouble. And, and when you answer that, I want you to talk to me as well about what you remember about the government response. Because, as you know, in Europe and in America, the media says that from the start, the Syrian government was brutal and it brutally retaliated and it didn't care who it, it killed, which, of course, I've got a big problem with. But I want you to tell me, because you live there, it was obvious from the word go that these were foreign agents, number one, and then talk to me about what the Syrian government did. Well, if they were really Syrians, those who started this whole thing, they would have been able to, uh, to, to, to let things go in a way that wouldn't harm their country, that would let the majority of the people really um, uh, feel, feel with them and support them. But the way things went, we're so much not Syrian in Syria. We have always been, we have always had this life where we live together without hatred, without asking about each other's religion. I don't remember at school asking my friend about his or her religion. But when strange concepts started to flow in and to advance, the things we heard were not familiar to us. This is not how we live. This is not how we speak. This is not how we think. And this is where we felt that things are not, not okay. And the thing where all those claims, I'm not in a place to defend anybody, not the government or not even, not anybody. But if the uh, government was as brutal as they have described it, well, I think we wouldn't have been where we are now. I guess. So, and if the mainstream media wants to say that they were killing and slaughtering and etc., etc., I wouldn't have been alive right now. I have never, uh, I have never been a um, crazy or fanatic supporter of anybody. And nobody ever harmed me for saying the truth. And here I am with you from the heart of Damascus saying what I really believe in. And when I find that someone is mistaken, I will criticize that person, no matter who it is. But the problem is how you say the truth and how you express your opinion. This is where people take you seriously or don't. And this is, again, where media plays the important role. I hope you get my point straight. I do. Yeah, it's terrific, Jamila. I'm just going to remind people who might just be tuning into the program. I've got Jamila Asi on the show. She's a translator and a Damascus University graduate, and she's live from Damascus at the moment. This is special, and it's important to me because this is what the mainstream media is not doing. It is not speaking to people like Jamila and others to ask them what they perceive has happened in their country since 2011. Jamila, I must ask, in the interest of being fair and balanced, have you ever worked for the Syrian government or do you have any contacts or, 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 or has any of your family worked for the Assad government? Well, yeah, my mother is a teacher, but she never worked for the Assad or for anybody else. She works for Syria in my, in my country. So, no, I, I don't work for the government, but many of my family members have jobs at the government, which is something common in any country. Of course, if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher in Syria, you are effectively, of course, working for, uh, for the state. It must be mentioned. But, um, but I knew that. I know you don't have any conflict of interest, but I just wanted to put that out there anyway. Uh -huh. Jamila, when Bashar al-Assad came to power in 2000, one of the things in, in the year 2000, one of, one of the things he promised, you can answer that if you want, <laughs> this is live radio, after all. But one, one, not at all, not at all. One of the things he promised back in 2000 
was that he was going to reform Syria and he was going to reform the democratic process and make it easier for people to become engaged in the process and make elections more transparent. We remember this. We remember how he came to power. His brother died. He was due to become the next president and Bashar uh, got the job. Did you see evidence, Jamila, over the last five, ten years that Bashar al-Assad's government did want to make democracy more inclusive in Syria? Well, I saw, um, I saw Syria has changed drastically since 2000, but, uh, and life has developed much more since that. And what I know is that all our neighbors, all the countries, were doing their best to stop the, this progress. And this is a clue that we were walking in the correct, on the correct way. You know, the Iraq war affected us, then uh, the Lebanon events, the killing of Rafiq al-Hariri and all these things also affected us. And then uh, Leban um, war in Lebanon and all the troubles Syria had because of that. So there was... Um, there was something really strange that the the more um, the more our life improved, the more we developed, and the stronger we became, we felt the pressure from outside. And this is, I think, this is the best clue or the best um, proof that yes, Syria has changed in the past 16 years. Now, the uh, the constitution has changed. The um, Parties, parties, uh, law has changed. Many changes have have happened, but unfortunately, this this is what something that upset all the world. Unfortunately, especially those extremists. It's um, twenty five minutes to the top of the hour. Needless to say, um, there are lots of tweets, which is uh, terrific. People can tweet at Richie Allen Show. I want to say hi to Sarah Willis. Hi, Sarah. Uh, thanks for the video about the Greater Israel Project. I'll have a look at that later on. Uh, Jamila might or might not have a comment on that. Um, we'll ask her. Uh, Zana in New Zealand says, we need to find a way to get Jamila as a commentator on mainstream media shows. It's critical information that the Western <laughs> world needs to hear. Jamila is laughing because she knows it'll be a cold day in hell before the BBC <laughs> phones her up and asks her to come on any of their programs. This you know, is disgraceful. Go ahead. Go I, ahead. I, would, I would love. I would love to be on the BBC and really, um, very um, logically, just talk to them and tell them that um, someone like you should have been more active and could have done a drastic change and could have affected the life of millions of Syrians instead of forcing sanctions on the Syrian people. Well, you could have helped prevent that and you could have saved the life of 12 million people who were displaced in Syria. You could have, pre you could have presented the right and the true image of what was really happening here. You wouldn't have described the extremist fighters as moderate rebels. So I would really love them to look back at what they have done and to look back at all the pain they have caused for the Syrian people, the people who died, the people who were displaced, the people who were, who are still now suffering from really hard conditions. And the first one is the economical condition. Now, one US dollars is for 500 Syrian pounds, which is a disaster. In 2011, one dollar was 48 Syrian pounds. So now everything is doubled and many things are absent. We don't have, sometimes people can't get their medicine. Some people can't get the basics of their life. So I would really love mainstream media just to take a look back and see now that, you know, that the threat now is just at your door, doorstep. Do you know what's tragic, Jimmy? Now, now people are escaping to Europe. Under the cover, they are using the name of refugees. And now, threat is unfortunately in Belgium, in France, and everywhere. And we feel sorry for all those victims. But mainstream media has a very bad role in that. And I believe that they should be put to 
court, they should be sued for what they have done because their crime is no less than the crimes of ISIS here. It's when, no um, less than the crime of destroying Palmyra and all the, the culture and civilization. The crime of mass media, of uh, mainstream media, is even worse than extremists because extremists don't have brains. They don't, they don't think. But people who run that media are educated people and they are supposed to defend us, not to attack us. And this is actually where I felt that my role as a Syrian, as an educated Syrian, to defy that media and start my own media with a group of people like me who want really to defend Syria. We might not have bullets, we might not have guns, but we have our words and we have the will really to show the truth and to say to the world we are still inside Syria and we see what is happening and we want you all to see with us what is happening through our windows not the windows of our neighbors so this is where I launched my project Shababik on Facebook you can check it Shababik Surya and this project aims at presenting the life inside Syria through the eyes of Syrian and we started a slogan now which means in English open your eyes so open your eyes and take a look through the windows of Syrians not the windows of BBC not through the windows of CNN not Fox News not anyone else this is brilliant stuff, Jamila. We, I'm going to ask you for links. I mean, I'm going to post some links anyway to um, the Shababik um, Surya Facebook page so people can find it there. Um, this is really important. What you're talking about, the media there, one of the tragedies in all of this is that after the Iraq war and the disaster that was the invasion of Iraq by the United States and by Britain, the media in Britain, you might remember this, but the, the press in Britain said that they would never make a mistake like that again. They would never so willingly support the government in a rush to war that they would be much more sceptical in future. And of course they lied because when... The Actually they didn't lie, Alan. Actually they didn't lie. They didn't exactly do the same thing. They even they did, it worse. did something worse. Exactly. They yeah. done it worse, yeah. didn't they? And that's the tragedy of it. They said, we, we will look out for your interests, and um, it, it, it's gone even worse. They, they've just become propaganda wings yes. now of... See Yemen and see Sudan and see all those countries, same mistake, and you repeat it over and over, and even in a worse way. Tell us about the Russian intervention on behalf of the Syrian government and what it seems to have achieved. As you said a few minutes ago, some of these lunatics, these extremists, might very well now be finding their way into Europe, um, which is unfortunately, which is something we, we'll, we'll have to deal with, of course. I never, I never would, I would never wish anybody to see even one, one on a thousand, one on a million of what we have seen. I really don't wish that. Well, about the Syrian, in, the Russian intervention, uh, I can. I can describe it in a very different way. Um, I remember that the coalition intervened in Syria something like three years ago almost, led by the US. And they said, we want to help you get rid of ISIS, which is now in Iraq, in Libya, and many other places. For three years, they have done nothing, and more people have been displayed, more people have lost their lives, etc. But since October 2015 or, no, or uh, November, when the Russians came, many people returned back to their homes because the uh, geographical uh, space where ISIS existed is now much smaller. They are limited to certain areas. And the best example of the progress being done on the ground is Palmyra, which was back a couple of days ago, which is the best victory for us, the Syrians. And at the same time, a victory with so much pain in our hearts because what was lost in Palmyra can never 
can never come back. It's a loss to humanity. So the Russian presence here have proved itself through the results. They, they didn't talk much, but from what I see on the ground, many people, uh, especially in Damascus, because, you know, Damascus, the city, it has Syrians from all around the country. Many people are starting to go back to their homes. And I think this is... This, this says a lot without uh, defending or without, uh, without praising anybody. This says much. And the Syrian army is doing also great effort helping people to get back to their homes because five years have really burdened, have really burdened us. Jamila, you, and I, I don't want you to go into any details. You don't need to mm-hmm. give details. But you've seen some... It sounds to me like you've seen some things that no man or woman should ever have to see. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, yes. I have lost many of my relatives. I have lost five cousins. Two of them were killed by um, moderate rebels, and the other two were killed uh, were martyrs in the army. And we have been displaced and moved from place to place, but. Still, I consider what I have seen much, much less than what other people have seen. If you check our uh, Facebook page, yesterday we posted a video on a man from, from Homs al Hamidiya, And this man, yeah, and he, tells, he tells a very sad story about what happened there. And his tears really tell the story of 24 million Syrians over five years. His tears really tell the truth. This is and the gentleman in the shop now. This is the gentleman who was opening yes. his shop. I saw the video. Yes. It's very, yes. very, very sad. Yes, yes. So uh, we had, we have, we have a reporter there and he interviewed that man. And that man was not shy. He did not hide his tears. His tears were really sincere and honest. They were for Syria not for Bashar al-Assad, not for Russia, not for America. His tears were for his country, for his lost country, for the streets, for the trees, for everything. So I think that mass m- mainstream media failed in showing the tears of that man. And this is where our role as, as activists and as journalists to, to wipe his tears and tears of all Syrians. I've just tweeted the link to the Shababik Surya uh, website. So I want, uh, fa- excuse me, Facebook page. So folks, I want you to go on there and I want you to like that Facebook page straight and away. Tomorrow we have, we have a surprise tomorrow. We have a surprise tomorrow from the heart of Palmyra, one of our reporters sending us material. And tomorrow also we will be, uh, we will be posting something from inside Palmyra to see, to see, to show the whole world that Syrians who stayed inside Syria and who are still fighting for it will never give up. And that today we have Palmyra and tomorrow we will have Raqqa and ISIS will be out and all those foreigners will be out. And the stronger the message and the more the expansion of that, that, that message, the more we spread the message, the stronger people will be. We want to empower people by delivering a strong and honest and true image about Syria being liberated from terrorism, from extremism, from fundamentalism, and from terrorism. I want to read some tweets out now, Jamila, and then I want to ask you a couple of more questions. I'm going to read some tweets out quickly. Uh, Dee was on to say, uh, hello Dee, by the way. Richie, I hope this interview goes far and wide. People need to know this information spread it like a virus. Uh, Sue was on to say, well said, Jamila, mainstream media should hang their heads in shame, uh, says Sue. I want to thank Tony Allars. Tony sent a link to this interview to the BBC. <laughs> Good luck, Tony. I don't think they'll well, be... Thank you. I don't think they'll be tuning in anytime soon. But, and um, tell him to send Shababik to LBBC too, so uh, that they see the tears of that man. Absolutely. Through our windows. By the way, Shababik, the word is Arabic. It means windows. So we want you, we want the BBC, Fox News to look through our windows, through Shababik windows, Syrian windows, not, not the mainstream media. 
brilliant. Hugh Bertes on Twitter says, we told our politicians no to interfering in Syria. They ignored the will of the people and they continued anyway. Paul Jackson says, go back to the 1930s. Arab countries had a beautiful way of life and now the empire has screwed it all up. And we've spoken so many times on this programme about what BP and the CIA did to Iran in 1953 when they threw Mohammed Mosaddegh out of Iran and all the interfering that's happened over the years. Jamila, I want to ask you, by the way, I just, want to, I just want to do a quick recap. If you're just joining the programme, I've got the terrific Jamila Assi on the line from Damascus in Syria. This is fantastic. This is what exactly the reason programmes like this exist is to provide a platform for real people with real stories um, in places like Syria, a wonderful country, a sovereign country with amazing people in it, with the brightest and best people in the world, uh, and it's been reduced to the the situation it's in now because of, well, because of the intelligence agencies of Britain and of America and of Israel, for reasons that we've gone into so many times before. Jamila, the greater Alan, the the I greater will Israel. Add something. Go ahead, you add something, and then I've got another question. Yes, Go ahead. Thank you. You just mentioned the word platform, and your words mean a lot to me and all the team in Shababik, and I hope that one day we will be able to be a platform to people all over the world, just like today. You were a platform to us and to all Syrians. Thank you very much. That means a lot to me. Not at all. And you're doing well. You've, you're, you're approaching 2,000 likes on Facebook. It'll grow and grow and grow as well. Tell me this. How, how much of an involvement do you see coming from the state of Israel? And we often talk about the Greater Israel Project the mm-hmm. desire for Israel to expand and push further north and east. What do you think when you hear that? Well, Syria has always been a pain in the neck for Israel and the Israeli movement. So, uh, um, no doubt that they have a strong uh, effect and a strong participation in what is happening now because when Syria, when Syria kneels down, all their ambitions and all their dreams will will come true and not only Palestine they will even expand to a larger space so no doubt that the moving the hand moving all events is right there in in Israel no doubt about that are you optimistic Jamila that soon the Syrian government will again control 100% of the country Yes. And you are, that's good. Are you, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but I must ask this, are you worried that the, well, the, we call them the dark actors, the, the US government, its secret agencies, its intelligence agencies, are you worried that they might have other plans? We hear about Saudi Arabia, a terrible, terrible, terrible place, uh, we hear about Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and possibly an invasion of Syria um, led by the United States. Do you worry about that? I don't worry about that because we have seen scenarios like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Libya and Sudan. All those countries had a situation in the beginning similar to that of Syria. But what happened there is that when things started, their leaders ran away and their people easily gave up. But here in Syria, we did not run away, we stayed here, and the government, despite, regardless of the way it works, but what I know is that it stayed here, and the army stayed here and defended the people. So we are different, and and at, uh, the talk about a Saudi or a, or a, a Turkish or a US invasion to Syria, is even not close to a myth because doing that would put them right on the front with another important player in the geopolitical arena which is Russia the Russians yeah. so exactly so that is not the talk of someone really politically educated someone who watches the news a simple person would even know that this is impossible but they are throwing trying to do their best to to recap or to, um, I don't know how to say it, just to cover 
their continuous failures. They want to cover up. They want to do something or say something that we still have some strength. And as usual, they do it through their usual channels. But this is far from true, far from reality, because Syria is a different situation. Five years, we, despite all difficulties, we still have people going to their job, people ha enjoying their daily life, come and see Damascus. I know everything is difficult, I know everything is expect expensive, but we still go out at night, we still enjoy our life despite mortar shells, despite fear of being kidnapped while traveling from one city to another. But as long as we believe in each other, no, Syria will never turn into a Yemen, Syria will never turn into a Libya, and the U.S. will never ever be able to, def to defeat us because we are now, those who stayed here after five years, I don't think that they can be easily defeated or they can easily give up. I don't at think so either. Me. I, at, least not, at least not me. Alex, um, Alex just tweeted this. Um, Alex Doust on Twitter. He said, amazing interview. I personally feel such guilt for what we've done and what we've allowed our politicians to do to Syria and other countries. And this is the tragedy, Jamila. Nobody, I can't find anybody, I can't meet anybody who accepts or who wants our governments to interfere and to, to breach the sovereignty of countries like Syria and Libya. This is the tragic thing. Our governments do things without the will or without the support of the people. We don't support what's happened in Syria. I know that. Through it's my, terrible, huh? Through, yes, through my uh, activity on social media pages, I have come to know many people, one of them, Eva Bartlett, that I have never met in my life. But when I saw the compassion and the solidarity of many people, foreign people, from different nationalities, from different religions and different beliefs, their love for Syria and their compassion with us as humans, not as anything else. When I saw them, I really, I really felt that I have another reason to stay strong. And just if I hate, if I have a problem with the French government because it's sending arms to jihadists here, of course I will not have. I will have uh, all for those who were lost in the attacks of Paris. Belgium was one of the countries that sent a big share of the Islamic fighters. You can check it. You can check uh, the numbers of jihadis coming from Belgium. But when I heard about what happened in Belgium last week, I really felt sad for all those people who lost their lives and who lost their beloveds. So governments uh, do not represent the people because you know, Richie, people just want a quiet life. Most people don't care about who comes or goes or who governs. They just want to have a quiet and peaceful life with, with honor and dignity. But unfortunately, sometimes the, governor, the, go the governments give this bad image. But um, the Syrian people never judged the uh, European people or American people or people of other countries from the behaviors of their of their uh, governments just like we expect you not to judge us or judge anybody else from who rules them absolutely right Jamila I think that's um, I think that's a good place to leave it for today I want to thank you very much for coming on the program I'm thank extremely you so much. privileged no it's a privilege to uh, uh, to have you on none mm -hmm. of us None of us in, in Britain or in Ireland or in, 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 in the United States have any idea what you've been through and what your family and your compatriots have been through. All we can do is wish you absolute Godspeed, wish you the best uh, with everything. You. I hope that very soon, I hope that very soon, all the world will be able to come here and see the beauty of Syria. I know we have a few blocks that have been destroyed. I know that we don't have the best streets in the world right now, but we really would like to you all to come and see that despite destruction, this is still the most beautiful country in the world. And the French, the group of French people, uh, people from the French parliament who came last week, I think they are very lucky. And uh, I hope that many people 
from all over the world will follow their steps and come and see that this is the most beautiful place in the world and it deserves staying here and fighting for it even if we were fighting from behind a screen from a simple platform like Shababik but we are still doing our best because Syria really deserves it. Jamila, thank you very much. Look thank after you. yourself and please thank stay in so touch. Much. Bye thank for now. So Wonderful. Absolutely terrific. Jamila Asi on the line to us there. It's at Shababik Surya on Twitter. I've just tweeted out the um, the Twitter page or the Twitter account for Shababik, which is a new social media. It's not. It's a new citizen journalist platform in Syria for for Syrians all over the country to make films and make videos and show what life is really like there to Westerners and maybe to Easterners in the absence of any real media in, uh, well, in our country, it must be said, and in Europe in general, and because of the way that country and that conflict has been portrayed in Western media. 